in. So I've been in the industry, as I said, for 17 years. In that period, in that 17 years, uh, I've now built five businesses. Uh, three I've actually built to a point that I could sell and I have sold successfully. Two of them I've built to over seven figures. Now, there's been one reason that's enabled me to experience the success I have to this point. It's not that I'm smart. It's not that I'm charismatic. It's none of those things. My secret has been that I am one step ahead of where I need to be. And that has really been something that has shaped me and will continue to shape me. And that's why I wanted to share today the future of the industry so you guys can be one step ahead. All right. So these trends are already starting to bubble away. But if you can get in front of them early enough, you will absolutely position yourself favorably in front of the competition. So there is a very boyish looking Dan there holding a kettlebell. This was the first trend that I got ahead of. But back in 2008, and I know this is hard to believe, but nobody was using kettlebells within the fitness industry. People didn't even know what they were. Um, but I saw it and I was like, this is going to be a wonderful training tool. So I wrote Australia's first ever accredited kettlebell course back in 2008. And that was a real catalyst for me. Uh, it took me to, you know, about 20 different countries to teach. We licensed it out in several markets. I built a team of about 25 to 30 presenters. And for 10 years, I ran an organization called the Functional Training Institute. That one kettlebell course was the catalyst to doing over $10 million in sales. Why? I was at the right place at the right time. And I just knew that this was going to be significant and big. So that was the first time that I really got ahead of that trend. Uh, the next one is, thank you, Ruth. I appreciate that. A course attendee. Next trend that I got ahead of was in 2011, and you can see it there on the top right, I launched an eight-week transformation program. And you might be going right now, well, what's so big and special about that? Because transformation programs are everywhere. But 13 years ago, no one was running them. But I wasn't only running it face-to-face, -face, I actually was running it online as well. So I personally built a WordPress membership site, had recipes in there, had home workouts. And so therefore I was delivering the program, not only locally, but also abroad. And that was the next thing that got me ahead. And then the next one after that was below, you can see my little studio there. In 2012, I launched semi-private training. I went over to the US, I'd often go to the US two to three times a year, jump in different conferences, go to different fitness uh, businesses to see what was trending. And I saw this thing called semi-private training by Rick Mayo, Alwyn Cosgrove, and I knew that this was going to be an absolute game changer, not only for me, but for the many people that I mentored and um, also took, you know, who also participated in our courses. And it was, it absolutely gave me this unfair advantage in that we did highly personalized training at a fraction of the cost of everyone else, got amazing results for people. So they are just three of the trends that I've been fortunate enough to get ahead of that have served me really well. Um, I talked about, you know, one of the first questions I asked is, what are some of the biggest trends you've seen in the industry? And our industry is still relatively young. Like really, it's really just got popularized in the 1980s. Uh, just put in the chat if you recognize well, the names of those people there on my screen, because these people uh, are really like we owe them a lot. Uh, they are some of the, yep. So we've got Arnie and Jane Fonda. Yep. That is it. So Arnie and Jane Fonda, uh, this is where fitness industry started to become commercialized. It started to be popularized in the 1980s. But as we go through, we can see that it is rapidly accelerated in the nineties. We started to see step-based home programs. We got Billy Blanks and Tybo. And then in the 2000s, it starts to kind of reflect the industry that we know today. So I don't know if anyone knows who is in that first uh, picture doing that impressive yoga position, but that is Duncan Peak uh, from Power Living Yoga. 
So this is in the 2000s. We started to see the boutique facility being really born. And then, of course, we saw CrossFit boom. And we owe a lot to our industry with CrossFit. It changed the style of facility, the fit out to the facility, the community, the connection, uh, and everything else. And then in 2010s, uh, we had the birth of the influencer. So again, uh, just put, if you know who that person is, I think most people do, uh, but we had the birth of the influencer. We had franchises become really popular, like really good branding, really good experience. We started to see, you know, exercises on TV. We started to see just a different level of energy. And then uh, wearables. Somebody talked about wearables uh, before, you know, in the 2010s, this is when people started to wear their Fitbits and the like. And wearables have been one of the most significant fitness trends in our industry now for about 15 years. If you look at the trends, so all of these, all of these um, organizations like Mind Body and the like will do these big surveys and wearables have been in the top 10 almost every year. And of course that is Kayla Eastein. So someone again said like one of the biggest changes they've witnessed in our fitness industry has been the effect of social media. And I could never have imagined in a million years the impact of influencers and social media. So our industry is rapidly changing. We can see how much it's evolved from, you know, wearing those leotards to influencers, to franchises, to wearables. But where is it going in the next decade plus? And that's what I want to be sharing with you today. And I'm going to divide it into four different categories. So how are preferences changing? And we're seeing this happen in front of our eyes. What's the impact of technology going to be? And what technology do we need to be aware of? For those that have physical sites, how does the design change? And then I'm going to talk a little about the weight loss drug market, because this is a space that I'm not seeing a hell of a lot talked about. But for me, it's probably the biggest disruptor in our industry, both, you know, in the next, you know, one to five years. So just put in the chat, you've jumped on this webinar, you've given up the scarcest resource in the world, which is your time to learn about the future of fitness. And I appreciate you doing so. So thank you very much. But what would you like to get out of our time together? Why did you jump on this masterclass? Why did you jump on this webinar? What is your expectation? Just drop it in the chat and then I'm going to get started on sharing some of those trends. As I said, I'm going to make you work on this webinar. Uh, I'm going to be asking for a lot of participation. I don't like to just deliver a whole lot of information. Um, I'm going to be asking you questions throughout. And I'm going to be getting you to really, I'm going to be challenging you to um, see how you can apply a lot of the trends that I'm going to be sharing. All right. So, Alexandra, thank you. Interested to learn about how the layout and design of gym spaces uh, will change and what is needed to stay ahead. Yeah, beautiful. I'm going to be talking about that for sure. Um, always reassessing the way forward with clients and during needs for them. Thank you, Ruth. Effie, stay updated. Yep, beautiful. Is there anything to help the aging demographic? They've got the in, they've got the money, but the industry ignores them. Yeah, it's a really good point, Ken. Um, you know, I wrote my thesis actually on Australia's aging population. And I believe right now, uh, the seniors market is a bit of a blue ocean. Uh, we've had a couple of clients within our program. Um, Heath opened a over 55s gym. He got it to a point now where it's uh, pretty much full. So he's opening his second location. We've had another gentleman, Van, also open an over 55s gym, got it full and is now opening a second location. So definitely a blue ocean. Freddie gets people's views on the trends. Information from industry masters, always good to know what the industry uh, trend is as I work as a sole trader. Um, 
currently looking at changing the layout of, of gyms and the best places equipment to put those resources to keep up what is what is new especially with the online older demographic want to know what is happening in the older people's space industry trends and increased knowledge um and do you think the recession will influence prices able to be charged dale yeah good really good question there dale i'm actually i've got some data to support that answer that i'll be sharing with you in a little while it's it's, it's fascinating question and um i'll make sure that i definitely cover that guys thank you so much for dropping those in so let's talk about trends uh so the first trend i'm going to talk about uh the shift in consumer preferences and there's three sub parts to this all right so the first one is strength training and as i said at my introduction my, the main focus for me is my company fitness profit uh, we, we coach and help over 150 different business owners and we can see firsthand how much the positioning of how popular the positioning of strength training is like consumers right now want this more than I've ever seen. And when you have a look at some of these surveys and I've put them in there, uh, lifetime, when they did their survey, they found that building muscle is the number one goal for this year, nearly 36% of respondents said that this was their goal. Now, last year it was really popular as well, but it's grown even more so. And Mind Body ran run this incredible survey each and every year. And for almost every year, the main outcome that the consumer has wanted has been to change their aesthetic, all right, to like lose weight and have an aesthetic transformation. But what ended up happening last year when the survey results came back is what was more important than the actual aesthetic was how I feel. And I feel like strength training and how I feel is very closely correlated with that. Uh, sculpt classes. All right. Really, uh, really booming space. Um, last year, I was at a conference in Singapore and Philip Mills was there. And he's obviously uh, the, the head of Les Mills. And he said he'd never seen anything like the popularity of sculpt classes. It was unparalleled. So this is, you know, where you blend resistance training with modalities like yoga or Pilates. Um, you know, Strong uh, is another franchise that's really boomed on this space. And Bookings have increased 471%. So again, strength training oriented. One of the big things that I always will do is I'll have a look at what some of the market leaders in terms of businesses are doing because they're normally ahead of these things a little earlier than everybody else. And so I've got a picture there of World Gym, but it's actually their new boutique club called World Gym Legacy, which is completely dedicated to strength training. And then if you have a look uh, Orange Theory now have a strength-oriented class. You know, they were traditionally renowned for their hit-based training. F45, if you have a look, they're now selling strength packs. You're seeing barbell training in there. They now have more autonomy, the franchisees. Uh, they have more autonomy to offer more strength classes. And Crunch is, an, is another one. So strength training right now is absolutely booming within the industry. Um Beck runs ads for a lot of fitness businesses. Beck, you've seen this in terms of running programs like uh, female and male weights programs and strength-based programs as well, haven't you? Yeah, absolutely. So the most popular ad at the moment is an all-new ladies weights program, and it is performing, outperforming everything else in the market across about 60 different accounts. Yeah, so that's uh, that's the strength training preference uh, we've seen. So one of our clients owns a he's owned a really successful facility for a, a long time, but what he did is he analyzed the data within his facility. This is much more on a micro level. He analyzed the data within his facility, and the best retention was for those that were doing his semi-private strength training strength training program. So he's completely turning his whole gym now into a semi-private strength training facility because people will pay more and people will stay longer. So that's the kind of impact in this trend. 
All right. So that's the first one that I wanted to discuss. The second one is wellness. Uh, so Google searches right now, wellness searches outnumber fitness five to one. And so traditionally, the wellness industry would be separate to the fitness industry. But now what we're seeing is we're seeing the industries intertwined more than I've ever seen so before. And we're really looking, we, we're, we're seeing it on a recovery space in particular. So now a lot of fitness businesses are starting to incorporate things like mindfulness, meditation, uh, hot and cold, like with saunas and cold plungers, uh, doing recovery with Normatec, uh, and so we're starting to see this real shift. And I found this uh, fascinating. 78% of Americans say that mental, emotional well-being is the top reason for exercising, right? So more so than their physical. So they're doing exercise, but what rates even higher than the physical well-being is their emotional and mental well-being. And that's what I mean, the feeling of exercise and people wanting to feel good is the main driver for a lot of consumers. Now, back to the question before in terms of recession and spending. Who asked that before? Uh, Dale, great question, right? So 87% of consumers in the Mind Body survey said they plan to maintain or increase spending on wellness services. And the two biggest services nutrition counseling or coaching and massage were up 15 and 11%. So I found that absolutely mind blowing. I know in Australia, we're not technically in a recession, but that's only because we've had a ton of migration. We're in a per capita recession, uh, if you look at it. So normally fitness, uh, you know, fitness memberships and everything else would get hammered at this point in time. But I think there's a more of an awareness around people and the importance of health. And I think we do have the pandemic to face, uh, thank for that. 62% uh, of people say health and wellness activities are the last thing that they would cut back on. So again, like, yes, there's going to be an, ec there's an economic compression. We know that people are spending less, all right? It's a very deliberate tactic. We've had 13 interest rate runs. Obviously people are gonna spend a lot less money, but, People would rather cut down other things and 62% said wellness and health would be. So I think we can be really encouraged by that. If you own your own business right now, you should be very, very encouraged by that. And then 50% of US consumers say wellness is a top priority in their day-to-day -day lives, up from 42%. Um, and that finding is from McKinsey. Now, what I've put there is I'll put a screenshot uh, from the Snap fitness website. So again, I was at this conference in Singapore last year and the Snap CEO said they did this huge survey amongst their members. And what it came back with is that they wanted to have the feeling like the reason they attended, the reason they signed up for the membership was the feeling of exercise. So they changed their entire branding and messaging and to really correlate that with that. So they said, we help create positive lifestyle habits. We're on a mission to help people create positive lifestyle habits that make them feel fantastic. At Snap Fitness, it's all about the feeling. Uh, and one of the things, and I'm going to give you a number of considerations in a moment, but we're seeing this intertwining of both the wellness and the fitness industry. Uh, and so what that will mean is that the personal trainer in the future, and this is where I've spent a lot of my time, I've been a personal trainer for about 15 years, uh, and I've coached several thousand, is it's no longer enough for a personal trainer just to be really good with exercise prescription and programming and cueing around the actual movement side. They're now going to have to expand their knowledge around nutrition, mindfulness, biohacking. They now need to be more well-rounded in terms of what they know and what they share with their clients because the client, the consumer is driving this. They are demanding it. And this was really became aware to me uh, about two months ago. Uh, Dr. Andrew Huberman came to Sydney to deliver a presentation and it's a Sunday night eight o'clock at night, 
it's and he's a you know if for those that don't know him um have a look at his podcast it's amazing the huber uh the huberman lab uh he's a stanford professor and it's a sunday night at eight o'clock at night and i'm in the icc with five thousand other people all right listening to andrew huberman speak about longevity and biohacking and stress control um, uh, and regulation and all of these things. And here are the consumers, primarily consumers, sitting around me at eight o'clock at night, paying several hundred dollars to learn this. This is what they want. So that's the second big shift. We've got strength, we've got wellness. Next one, less is best. So what do I mean by less is best? Is if you go back, in the last 10 years, there's been a real emphasis on high intensity training, pushing people really hard. I had slides of, you know, F45 before and CrossFit. These have been booming businesses. However, what we're seeing is that people actually want more, uh, you know, relaxation, restorative based programming and services as well. Um, Dan, can I just interrupt you one second? Yep. Lorraine, Lorraine just had a question asked, what is biohacking? Yeah, so biohacking is like this big umbrella term. There's a number of different things that are kind of encompassed within it. But essentially, it's like, how can I live longer? And how can the quality of the life that I have right now be improved? All right, through different biohacking techniques. And so that's, um, you know, there's there's lots in that around like supplementation, exposure to different things and minimizing it. Um, but uh, yeah, that's it, the umbrella term. So less is best. Garmin reported that the fastest growing activities among their users were Pilates. So as someone mentioned before, reformer Pilates, breath work and yoga, all right? So people are now wanting, you know, more calming, restorative base activities. Uh, stretch lab. So I went over to Santa Monica, I don't know, maybe six six years ago. Uh, I was teaching at Idea World and I went to this place called Stretch Lab and they did essentially PNF stretching for 20 minutes. It's now come to Australia. It's got 400 locations and they are owned by Exponential Fitness, who is a powerhouse in the, in the boutique fitness space. They're planning to open another 500 more. All right. So mobility training is absolutely booming as well. Uh, Life again, I look at the big businesses. What are they doing? Because generally they have great market research and they are ahead of the trends. So, what are Lifetime Crunch 24 hour fitness doing? They've now got classes that have recovery, rich, breath work. They are getting ahead of these things. And, you know, I speak to fitness businesses all day, every day. That's essentially my role, that's my job. And I ask them about their different classes. And mobility classes, stretch classes, breath work classes are absolutely like people are booking them in. It's off the charts right now, in addition to the strength side. So this is where I'm going to get you to really interact. And I really want you to think, because it's like, oh, great, Dan, here's a whole bunch of research that you've read. Like, you know, I, I, I researched this for uh, weeks leading up to this presentation. It's great. That's fantastic, Dan. But if all it is is some facts and it has no impact or practicality, then it's pretty futile. So some considerations that I want you to think about and I want you to contemplate and I even want you to drop into the comments, into the chat, is if you're a fitness business owner or you're in a management position or you're a head coach somewhere, knowing that the trends I've just shared, strength training, less is more, uh, and also the integration of wellness, do you need to make any changes to your programming right now? Like when you look at your timetable, does it reflect these trends and where the industry is moving? Are you ahead of it? So that would be the first thing. Uh, second thing is how are you going to optimize your space? And I'm going to talk about space in a moment, but if you have a look, if strength training is a trend, then do you need to get more racks and strength training equipment, for example? If you want to integrate more of the recovery side, do you need a recovery zone like several of our clients have integrated into their business? Next one, coach development and training. So if you have a team of coaches or even if you're a solopreneur yourself, 
do you need to do some upskilling and professional development if people want more, say, mindfulness or they want more nutrition uh, coaching? Do you need to look at yourself and have a look at your professional development calendar and go, these are the different courses, programs, and resources I need to get a hold of so I can be ahead of this? And then the last one, you know, I shared with you, Snap. Does your messaging and positioning need to change right now? Do, you know, like when you have a look at what you're putting out to the market, do you need to make sure that it's relevant and connects? Like Beck shared before, a lot of our clients are now doing strength-based ads on Facebook. Why? Because that's what's connecting, but they've had to change their messaging accordingly. So I'm just going to give you a moment just to kind of consider those. Uh, just put in the chat. I'd love to hear from you. What changes are you going to consider in your programming? How are you maybe going to change your space? What maybe PD are you going to do so you can stay ahead of these trends? And will you change any of your messaging or positioning? So just put that into the chat and uh, I'll give you a couple of minutes to do so. Yep. So Effie, I think we always need to evolve and change. Absolutely. It's the, the you know, the, the only constant in life is change. Uh, and so you can either resist it or you can with it. All right. I know which one I'd rather do. Um, agility and flexibility is very important. Absolutely. And it's great to see that this is being recognized by more people. So again, put it in the chat. Like I've shared with you a bunch of different um, trends that are moving within the industry how will that change either your programming, your space, your development, or your mess messaging and positioning? I'd love to hear just from a couple of people before we move on to the second big shift. So Dale, more about recovery, link with a link with a chain of massage therapists to refer to and emphasize strength. Awesome. Love that. Like doesn't and I love that what you've said. It doesn't necessarily mean you need to offer it. But if you can start thinking about your JVs, your partnerships, uh, this is what your client wants. So why don't you work with somebody else who may be an expert in that space to provide it? Uh, Tani, more holistic approach to programming and member onboarding processes. Yeah, absolutely. We're seeing a lot. So one of the big evolutions we're seeing on the, on the ground with our clients is non-sweat coaching, where they are now booking in with a trainer, uh, to talk about all the other areas to support the exercise programming. So let's talk about your sleep hygiene. Let's talk about your recovery. Let's talk about your nutrition. Let's talk about your stress management uh, to support, obviously, the exercise itself. Um, uh, how do you market female and male-only strength classes without discriminating? Beck, did you want to handle that one? Yeah, for sure. It just comes down to the wording and the messaging that you use. So we obviously know that everybody needs strength training and it's just the way it's worded, but it's not discriminating. We're just targeting differently. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, all right, so there's some awesome feedback. Uh, yeah, and, and also like, Alexander, it's a really good uh, point you make. I'll read it out. Our programming can be difficult when members are not always open to change. I find small changes to the timetable is more effective. And I think that's uh, that's a really good point. You don't want to just overhaul everything all at once. Uh, you know, change management is a, is a very important thing as an organization, but you want to do it in stages. And one of the biggest things I would recommend is you have to explain the rationale as to why, right? If you make a change, make sure you communicate the rationale. Hey, this is what people... This is what we found that the research wants. This is the, re the research is saying, finding that this is beneficial. And always think about the WIFM principle. What's in it for me? Like, what does this change mean for me? All right. And so you always want to communicate and convey something that benefits the, consu you know, the consumer on that side. Uh, I love it. Great feedback so far. Amazing feedback. I'm going to keep charging through because I am mindful that I've got 20 minutes and uh, we do need to finish at one o'clock sharp. So next shift is technology. Uh, obviously technology is it, like the, the amount of change and speed in terms of its development is next level right now. But one of the things I just want to get really clear with you on is technology is not here to take our jobs. All right. So what we offer is truly unique 
it's a it's a it's an incredible face to face service in most cases. Uh, and if COVID taught us anything, it taught us that people undervalued connection and community. And coming out of it, this is now much higher in terms of their values. All right, and so like a lot of businesses that thought, you know, just this online trend was going to continue like Peloton and the like have come unstuck because they under underappreciated, undervalued the power of face-to-face -face connection. So technology will help us do our jobs better. That's the best way. It will, it will help our clients get better results. It will not replace us. All right. Um, you know, AI is like, we're hearing lots and lots about it. And and like, it's not for me to talk too much about it today because I'm not the expert on it, but it is, th there are certain things that AI can do that definitely make our jobs easier. And it means the clients are going to get better results. Uh, and that's it. Like what clients want, one of the other big trends that I didn't cover is clients actually want personalization. They don't want to walk into a facility or a class and feel like another number. What they want is they want their goals to be considered, their preferences to be considered, and they wanna have personalized prescription as a result. Technology helps us do this, right? It is there to assist. Uh, it layers accountability and transparency. So what we're gonna see is we're gonna see dashboards uh, and, you know, like when you have a look at it, like Aura Ring and Whoop and some of the wearables are already doing it, but we're going to be able to see dashboards of every client around their nutrition, around their sleep, around their recovery, and then we can tailor their exercise prescription accordingly. Um, you know, if someone's had a bad night's sleep and we can see that and we can see their HRV data and everything else, then we can better tailor and curate the exercise experience to be aligned with that. Technology is going to prevent injuries, all right? Again, like we're going to be able to see it when a client is at a, you know, when they're really like stressed, when they have, haven't had enough sleep, when maybe their kids have been keeping them up or awake at night, we're going to know to reduce the intensity. We're going to know not to actually, uh, you know, load stress on stress. And um, I just read your comment there, Angela, and the Endurance World Training Peaks platform already does this. Yeah, it's great. Absolutely. And so imagine right now, if we had a universal dashboard that had every client that we could see this, and then we can say, hey, look, you had a bad night last night. Yeah. How do you know? I can see it on the dashboard. I'm going to get you to do some more restorative based movement, some more breath based movement, get you into a more of a parasympathetic state rather than just load you up right now. Uh, because all that's going to do is lead to injury. Like how powerful is that as uh, someone that's obviously providing the service? Uh, one of the things which is, and again, this came out of this conference that I was in in uh, in Singapore, is Snap found that 40% of their members want to get movement outside of the gym, which is awesome, which is, which is really, really good. But 80% of them want recognition for that. So they want the pat on the back. They want the good job. They want the text message saying, Hey, stellar, stellar job getting that 10,000 steps in or that walk or whatever else it is. Right now, that's very, very hard to do unless we ask. But again, technology is going to make this easier where we can just have greater transparency and visualization around what everyone is doing. And then the VR market is going to explode. Obviously, Meta's big in this. They've made some big acquisitions. But what's really interesting about diving into the VR market is they're not coming after our clients, all right? So the VR market is primarily going to target the 80% 80, 80 of people that don't have a gym membership. Why? Because they're going to make it easy to do from home. They're going to make it fun. They're going to, it's, it's not intimidating or scary, all right? And so the VR market is after that space, not so much the space that we have. All right, so we will see some significant changes in this. Uh, we're going to see some changes in wearables. So a lot of our clients have MyZone, for example. Uh, but really what we're going to do is we're going to start to see wearables that not only just measure intensity, but, you know, like BFT is a fantastic example. What BFT have done is they've designed their own wearable 
where you get rewards for actually training at a particular heart rate for strength-based programming. You get awards at the end of the session. There's like a one, two, three ranking for those that stay within the heart rate. So you're not just getting rewarded for exertion and intensity, but more about like, you know, doing the right things with the programming itself. Uh, so technology is going to shift. It's going to change. We have to embrace it. Uh, and here's some of the considerations I want you to have. Wearables. We know it's been one of the key, key, key fitness trends for a long, long period of time. Knowing that, what are we going to do with our clients? Knowing that they want wearables. Are we going to, are we going to have a uniform wearable? How are we going to get the data from the wearable? How are we going to then prescribe from it? Uh, they want a holistic overview of their health. All right. So right now it's not merely enough. We need to know about their sleep, their nutrition, their stress. Uh, how do you recognize activity outside of the gym? Because this is what people want. And then scoreboards work effectively well, all right? So obviously like MyZone is a perfect example of a scoreboard, but how can you integrate scoreboards uh, as a technology piece into your service offering? So there's some of the key considerations from technology, but let's move on to design. And then I'll get uh, some insights and some feedback on both technology and design itself. So one of the big things, and this is uh, continued to do so, is open design. So if you look at gyms right now, I think in the last you know five to 10 years, it's been reported that they have 30% less machines, primarily cardio-based machines. So more open is better. All right. And that facility there is Tim Lyons uh, Legacy over in the US big open space. You want to have the strength training on the perimeters on the sides. We know obviously strength training is popular. So we have the racks all around the facility itself and we have as much openness as possible. Lighting is key. All right. So you can see some impressive lighting there. Um, I've just helped a uh, gentleman open a gym in Perth. Uh, it's called Zero Gym. And if you have a look at it, the lighting is hugely impressive, all right? He's got this amazing, like, logo in the lights. He's got these great hexagons and everything else. And he's a young guy, very popular on social media. So he needs to make sure that his facility has amazing lighting. Why? Because these things are being carried by absolutely everybody. You're not doing a gym workout unless it's on social media, right? So people are taking photos, they're taking videos, uh, content is king. And then he's actually able to then rent that facility out for influencers so they can pretend it's their facility and the like. And that in itself is a revenue stream. So you want to have really, really good lighting. Yeah, definitely not flashing lighting, but uh, good lighting is key. Um, and, you know, just on like design, we're seeing the yard really... Uh, prop up as a franchise that is growing. Uh, the first yard opened up right near uh, one of the gyms I own. And when you walked in, you could see why that was the case. It was this beautiful space. It was all very dark, but then the lighting was bright. It was powerful. Uh, and it was very, very compelling. Uh, you want to have rest and recovery areas. All right, so a lot of people now will want to go in and they'll want to do their own their, their own self myofascial release. They're going to want to do their own mobility. They're going to want to do some of their own, you know, like NSDR, non-sleep deep re relaxation work. All right, so where are we creating spaces for that to happen within our premises? You want to have small spaces within large spaces. And I find this really interesting. I go to a gym here in Sydney called Sydney Sporting Club. And what happens a lot is a lot of people will have an app on their phone. A lot of them seem to do the 98 Riley Street. They'll have all their equipment. They'll have their app on their phone. They'll do the programming that's on there. And they've got this little space within the big space. And so you want to have little spaces within your big space if you're more of like a commercial-based gym so people can actually 
follow that online trainer or online program and do their own work within there. All right, so key considerations from a space perspective. Number one is equipment. What do you need to change or do differently from an equipment perspective? Do you need to get rid of, update some of the equipment so you create more of that open space? Do you need more strength-based space? Do you need more of this? Uh, do you need more of the mobility and recovery-based equipment? Uh, design. How does your design of the space change? Like we're, we've got clients probably opening gyms probably one every two weeks at the moment. Um, and we want to make sure that the design has those spaces within the spaces, that has the strength equipment, that has the impressive lighting, that has, you know, like if here in Sydney, one of the best design gyms or series of gyms, I believe, is One Playground. Have a look. Like the gym has evolved so much. Like they are beautiful spaces right now that have been designed. It's an experience when you walk in there. What lighting needs to change? Like the big fluorescent lights need to go. You need to have something that is, uh, you know, I was speaking to an electrician and he was saying that the amount of lights and the ex how extensive it is now when he does these gym fit outs is on another level. Um, like they need project planners just for the lighting alone. So there's some of the key considerations I'd love to hear, based on those considerations, you've seen what's happening with tech, you're seeing what's happening on space. What if, like, how does that impact what you're doing right now? So, or how will that impact? Or what will, may you consider changing as a result of what you've heard? Just drop it in the comments and then we're going to close up with the uh, the weight loss drugs. So a couple of things, design quiet space for mind body modalities. Absolutely, Lorraine. Yep, you want to have it quiet. You want to have it open. You want to have uh, a lot of nature in there as well. Um, and there's some really impressive, like one of the big things I would recommend is go and have a look at these spaces. Uh, go and go into the one playgrounds, the yards, the um, flow athletics of the world and have a look. Uh, at how these spaces are evolving and changing. You know, back when I opened, you could put a whole bunch of equipment in a dirty room. It, it, it's it's changed a lot. It really, really has. Um, so what can, based on how technology is evolving, how the space is evolving, how is that going to impact what you do? Just drop it in the chat. I'd love to hear from a few people and then we'll move on to our final category. So Megan, love incorporating more open spaces into our gyms with awesome lighting there. Total Fusion Brisbane. Yeah, that's a great example. Fantastic example. Um, Leon has absolutely nailed it with Total Fusion. Um, so if you're in Brisbane or if you're ever uh, going into Brisbane, you need to check that space out because it, it encapsulates a lot of what I've talked about today. Um, Dale GLP ones. Yeah, I'm going to get onto that in a moment. Uh I feel the gym, Alexandra, I feel the gym is currently quite cluttered. I would like to incorporate a stretch recovery area that is unimpeded by members who are using weights. Yeah, I think that would be really wise. I think they would really appreciate that. And I think it would be hugely valued as well. All right, home stretch now. I'll talk quickly about GLP-1 drugs. Uh, so my partner is a doctor. She's a, a GP. And um, a couple of years ago, she was talking to me about Ozempic Covey and uh, all the things that are happening in the weight loss drug space. And I was like, holy shit, like this is going to mean like this is going to challenge our industry because here we are on one hand, like if people want to lose weight, we're asking them to go into a place that can be super intimidating, you know, you know, clicks everywhere, mirrors, people everywhere. You're asking them to use machines that they've never touched. They feel awkward uh, and they feel intimidated. You're asking them to drive there. All right. And then they've got to pay money for that as well as all the time. I'm like, man, that's a big leap versus, hey, you know, I'm going to their injectables at the moment, but I'm just going to inject myself. Right. So I was like, this is going to impact us. This is going to have a significant impact on our industry. Well, it has, but not the way that I actually thought. I was fearful, but when you have a look 
at what the data is showing, we should be quite encouraged right now. So it's booming right now, the industry, like absolutely like it's off the charts. Uh, like if you have a look at like what Weight Watchers and Noom are doing with GLP-1 drugs, uh, right now, I think it's a $30 billion industry, but it will be $100 billion by 2030. Uh, again, look at the big brands and what they're doing, Weight Watchers, Noom, but also Exponential um, have just gone and uh, acquired Lindora. I think I think their one is Lindora. And then Lifetime have created their own as well. So now they're going, all right, we've got these weight loss clinics with our uh, gyms and everything else because it's this great cross-pollination and uh, there's going to be significant alignment between the two. 4% of adults are currently using the drugs. By 2030, it could be 9%. So you guys got to be up on this. One out of every 10 of our clients is going to be on one of these. But here's what I was really encouraged by. All right. So 35% of the drug users ex um, exercise prior to taking the medication. Now, 71% reported doing exercise whilst taking the drugs itself. So what we're finding is that people are actually more inclined to exercise once they get on the drug itself. And the, all the research is supporting that. It absolutely is. They need to be exercising. We know that. Uh, but what is great is that the consumer behavior is matching that right now as well. So I really... um. Where I'm really encouraged is uh, right now, a lot of our client, not a lot, but like there's going to be several clients. Um, there's going to be several clients that are going to be taking these drugs, all right? And I know somebody just put in the comments, it won't last because it's not safe. Uh, we know we, we know it might not be in, there's heaps of like, there's heaps of side effects from that. However, people are still going to take it because they're going to get the results, right? And so it's like, how can we as professionals offer our product and service to support people on it? Like, is there specialized programs that you should be offering to people that are on GLP ones? I would say yes. All right. And so I would be creating and curating specialized programs to help people that are on the drugs themselves. Uh, and so that essentially kind of closes up the trends itself. I just wanted to kind of finish with a little bit of a story on trends. Uh, who used to, just put a little wire and in if you used to frequent blockbuster video uh, at some stage in your life, all right? For me, it was an absolute institution, all right? So a Friday or Saturday night, a weekend wouldn't be complete without a visit to the old blockbuster video, all right? I'd be obviously perusing the aisles there. We'd get the, the DVD, we'd wait in a really long line, and then, you know, I'd have to pay an exorbitant amount of late fees because I'd off, quite often forget to bring it back. Uh, it was a powerhouse. It was valued at $8.4 billion. They had 9,000 stores. This was a huge, huge business, in 1997, a small disruptive company was born called Netflix, all right? Now, Netflix, their original business model was very different to what it is today. It was mail home DVDs. Why? So you didn't have to pay late fees. You didn't have to line up, all right? Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix, went to Blockbuster in 2000 and he said, acquire my business, let me head up your technology div uh, division. The way people are consuming entertainment is going to change. I want $50 million for the business and I'm going to head it up. Blockbuster laughed in their face. They said, no, we are a, uh, a you know an absolute powerhouse at $8.4 billion. We're not giving you $50 million. All right. Netflix innovated. They got ahead of the consumer demand. They got ahead of where they needed to be. And they really simplified, you know, the, or they changed, they disrupted the way that we can consume information. So right now, out of that 9,000 blockbuster stores, there is now one. Netflix, that little irrelevant company that was said no to for $50 million is now worth $65 billion. So why do I tell you this story? The lessons here are clear. The only constant in life is change. You need to embrace it, not fear it. Uh, in order to in order to grow, you really need to have your finger on the pulse of the ever evolving needs and preferences of your customers, and you need to make the changes to your model accordingly. So this applies to your products, your services, and your marketing strategies. And this is what it takes to be great. 
and the choice is yours. So that is the future of the fitness industry. Thank you so much for being on this session. I appreciate you. One last reminder, I'd love to see you at the Filex Business Summit. Uh, it's in Hilton on August 22 and 23. We've got amazing speakers. You can get the early bird discount. You can save yourself a ton of money with that code as well. And uh, I hope that you guys got some value, some insights, some information that are going to help serve you have a bigger impact in this wonderful, wonderful industry of ours. Thank you so much, guys, for watching. I appreciate you.